<laughs> All right, guys, and we are live again. Um, what the heck are we doing here? You might ask. Um, so, all right, as many of you know, I'm new to this live streaming thing. I'm a computer geek. I play with computers all day long, and it only recently occurred to me that, you know, maybe doing a live stream would be a lot of fun. Um, it has been a lot of fun, but it's also given me a really big learning curve in terms of, like, learning all the tech and the microphones and, and the audio switchers and everything else that's happening. And right before we did our last live stream, as fate would have it, uh, like, Literally right when I hit the go live button, my audio switcher, the lovely ATEM Mini Pro, uh, decided I'm going to ignore you utterly, uh, requiring me to pull the power, come back in. When I came back in, it thought, hey, you know, what would be fun is if we developed howling audio feedback problems and switch the mic levels to things that are not known in this universe outside of, say, alien movies and so forth. And uh, so we did it. You know, it, it was, so it was horrible. Uh, I mean, let's just be honest with it. Anyway, so uh, I spent the last 10 minutes of the last stream apologizing for the horrible audio, and the poor guys who put up with it were sitting there going like, oh my god, Pete, I don't know if he's saying anything sensible or not because I can't stand the audio. Um, but realistically, a big reason I'm doing these audio streams is so I can come back later and say, well, hey, anyway, I, I, funny you should ask that question topic because it turns out I covered it in some detail on the audio stream. Here is the link. Uh, and I can't do that if the link I'm going to point you to is horrible, horrible audio screaming in your head. You'll think that I'm a, a horrible person, really, and I don't want to do that to you. Anyway, so here we are again. Uh, this is live stream take two. It's 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 like two and a half hours after take one. Take one is going to be disappeared from the internet as soon as we're done with take two, if assuming this one comes out well. And um, here we go. Um, the topic for today is comic pricing. In particular, what are comic books worth in the market, in the real world, and and how do I make money off of them? I mean, how do I get the money out of my comic collection? I paid a lot for the whole thing. I might want to see some money on the back end. How do I make it happen? And I may even, there's a chance, give more succinct answers than I did the first time. I'm probably going to cover a lot of history of copies, a lot of interesting things in the program. It may be coherent. It may not. I'm going to really try this time, and we're going to make it so it is as sensible as we can. All right, so from the top, let's hit the basic question first. What are my comic books worth? What? How do I know, right? All right, the true answer to all this stuff is your comics are worth whatever pay anyone pays you for them. This sounds really flippant. When I heard it from the first guy who told me that, I thought, jerk, you know, and and, and I didn't take it particularly well. But, it, it, like, it's true of pencils. It's true of oil derricks. It's true of apartment rentals in Sausalito. It's true of comic books. It's The market's going to tell you what your comic books are worth, and all you can do is... is you know, have the right expectations going into that whole trade. So how do you how do you figure that out? Well, it's a really great question coming with, down with comic books because as far as I can tell with comic books, the worth of the comic book is not really in question. People love comic books. They've been loving comic books since there were comic books. The real problem with comic books is liquidity in that a lot of people love them, but it's hard to find the right buyers for the books you may have. And if you have a lot of comic books, it's hard to turn them into cash on short notice. And so the answer to how much you'll get for your comic books is really going to be a spectrum of trading between your time and you know, and, and the money you'll get for them. In other words, if you want to get um, uh, if you want to get top dollar for your comic books, be prepared to spend some time on the whole project. If uh, you don't have time, be prepared to sell at rock bottom prices. If you don't have something special, all right. Now here's where the big disclaimer comes in. If your collection is if this is if you are holding the latter day equivalent of the Edgar Church collection, I, you know you've got tons of high end nineteen fifties horror comic books from EC. You've got you know the first appearance of Superman. You've got all of these you know, like very cherished comic books like that. You don't have a problem. You are not in any kind of trouble whatsoever. Honestly, if you have any kind of high end Silver Age uh, collection or even Bronze Age collection at this point, if you were one of these guys in the seventies who really took care of your comics, wrapped them in butcher paper, and and babied them to death. You're going to do just fine. You will be able to sell whatever you've got in pretty short order. Uh, on the other hand, if you're like me, and, and I'll be honest, I have 60,000 some comic books, and most of them are the kind of comic books you'd have if, like me, you start collecting in the 1970s, 
spent whatever a newspaper boy's salary was, um, bought what you could as time went on, and just kept the habit up. So I have a lot of stuff I just bought off the racks as it went. I bought, I collect very widely a lot of this because I got involved with comic base back in you know in the you know, early nineties. And so I tend to buy one of everything, regardless of whether it's my favoriteest thing ever. But I don't have a, a, an Avengers number one. I don't. I, I used to, but I no longer have a Hulk 181. I know I've never had an action number one. I've held one in my hands, but I don't own one myself. So uh, you know, I have kind of generic e comic books uh, as as these things go. And so I'm assuming you're kind of in the same boat I am as we're as we're doing this whole talk here, uh, in that you have a lot of comic books that aren't the sort of thing people would beat down your door from three states around to get to you just have a, you know you'd like to see some money for them at the end of the day and so that's the, where the advice is going to be coming from with everything i tell you you know today um so let's talk about comic pricing first then we're going to get into you know what, what comic base does about comic pricing and then we're talking about selling and then we're probably going to get out of here because honestly this is my second time through the entire talk <laughs> i'm going to try to make it better for you but it's you know the novelty is somewhat diminished for me today. So, uh, first of all, when you talk about comic pricing, you first of all have to give up to Bob Overstreet. Bob is the guy, the author of the uh, the Overstreet Comic Book Price Guide. You can't. It, it, all of us in the comic field owe an amazing debt to this man. He's the first guy who ever tried to take on the entire world of comic books, uh, you know, and, and say what was out there from all different branches of things, you know, uh, whether he liked it or not, whether it was gold or whether it was silver or whatever else. Uh, he set the grading standards that we still live by today. He's the first guy to quantify, you know, what are what, you know, what are the conditions, you know, that, that we should be looking for in a comic book? What are the storage things we should be looking for? I mean, is it a really good idea to put them up in my attic in the 150 degree heat so the you know paper can all, all get browned out and so forth and if it does get browned out how much does that affect the guy you know the value uh he's the first guy to really start tracking who are the really influential artists and writers of the era you know uh, and also to start trying to figure out uh, out of this whole country what you know what, what's a frazetta you know original you know I, you know illustrated you know uh, comic book in a 1950s you know, forgotten comic, what's it worth? This is an amazing task. None of us could have ever dream of doing it without the frame of reference that Bob Overstreet, you know, created. And so, you know, when we come back to everything we're doing in comic base, I, I want to, I want to give credit to the giants whose, you know, shoulders we stood upon. And Bob Overstreet is definitely one of them. Um, my personal history of Bob Overstreet goes back to, I was probably 12 or 13 years old. I was spending the summer with my grandparents and I, you know, was a comic book collector because everyone was in my age. And I had gotten a hold of the Overstreet Comic Book Price Guide. And as, you know, I think I want to say the Watergate hearings were on TV. Uh, and, and I'm sitting there with the Overstreet Price Guide with the Invaders on the cover. And I do not want to watch TV news. And so what I did is I spent the entire summer memorizing the Overstreet Comic Book Price Guide. And I could not believe that Fantastic Four number one was going for $1,000. It's one of the few salient factors I'm 100% certain of. If it turns out all my recollections are wrong, that's the one I'll stick by until the end. Uh, but he also had a, a, a squad of advisors that would you know, tell him you know, what the prices were out in their area, who would advise him on, on setting the overall price for all these different things. And I found the entire project absolutely fascinating. And I thought, this is what I want to get into. I mean, I don't want to invest in stocks or bonds or one of those grown-up things that all the boring people invest into. No darn, I want, I want to get invested in comic books. Um, so fast forward years later, and I started doing comic base. Uh, it was originally, as we covered the first broadcast, a way for me to uh, more or less offload a bunch of comic books I'd piled up over the years. Um, you know, and uh, you know when I first started, even you know tracking my own comic books you know, early, on early computers, the first word processor program I ever used, it wasn't to write in a resume; it was to write a list of my comic books. Uh, when I first used a spreadsheet, it was to make a spreadsheet of my comic books, and you'd go through each of the six thousand or so comic books, look up each one of them the overstreet price guide write down what it what, what it was worth and repeat next year this was insanity i you know even for six thousand books i was never going to do this more than once um so when i did comic base um a lot of the things you see in comic base draw back to that era you know it's like why did comic base 1.0 import from spreadsheets because guess what they were importing from my spreadsheets with your earliest values uh, comic Base 1.0 had 20,000 comic books in it. Um, and back then, that seemed like an approachable amount of comic books to deal with. It was a lot. I mean, uh, but it seemed like the sort of thing where I thought, well, 
you know, human beings could put together a squad of retailers, you know, that you, you know, trusted and could deal with, uh, visit enough conventions, and come up with the pricing on 20,000 comic books. It seemed like a hard job, but it could be done. Uh, and especially, it turned out, we had to do it because when we first did Comic Base, we walked, you know, approached Bob Overstreet and said, hey, Bob, you know, we'd love to rent your list, you know, you know what for the data on these things. Uh, and he said, yeah, I can't do it because uh, we're already tied up. We are um, have an exclusive arrangement with another software program. It was on DOS. It was horrible. But uh, not, nevertheless, they were locked up with us, so they couldn't make a deal with us. So what we did for Comic Base 1.0 is we actually assembled our own list of trusted advisors, uh, and I'd go down to each of their shops with a notepad in hand and spend you know an afternoon or a couple days at their shop. I'd go down to different you know conventions and everything, and you'd make lots and lots of notes about where everything was moving, and then you'd come back and over the course of the software release cycle, which was yearly at the time, uh, I would try to price out what do I think twenty thousand comic books are worth in today's market. Now, there's a standpoint that I took in doing the pricing, which really affects comic base from the, you know, word, you know, word go. Um, and that was, I wanted to price it at what would I pay for the book? It, you know, which is to say, what's someone who is, knew something about comic books? You know, you're not just a noob. You're not just a rookie. You know something about comic books. And also you've got some choice in what it is you're buying. Um, so, uh, I mean, let's be, let's face it. If there's a comic book in the world or anything in the world where there's only one of them, if you want it, you're going to pay whatever the guy selling it is going to ask you for it. There's no question about it. I mean, there is only one, you know, uh, Maguire 70th home run, you know, baseball in the world. If you want it, you're going to pay whatever he wants for it. You know, there's only one, you know, uh, you know, there are James Bond stunt cars where there's only one or maybe three of. You know, uh, you know, if 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 you had the comic book that Stanley was, you know, signing with his dying grasp, because I picture Stan and I always picture him signing something with his dying you know breath uh, if you have that one you know the sky's the limit knock yourself out you will pay whatever it is if you want it uh, we're not talking about that. We're talking about things where you can find a few of that comic book out in the world and you've got some choice as to what you'd pay. So if you're talking about, you know, not, you know, not Fantastic Four number one, perhaps, but let's say you're talking about Fantastic Four number 147. Um, I could go to several different comic book stores, at least I could back in, you know, my day, and find that one in the bins or on the, on the walls of those ones. And I'd say, okay, well, you know, these guys are a little high. You know, I like those guys over here for that one, but eh, their condition's a little, you know, you know jank, whatever the thing is and you you know as a smart person you figure out what would a smart person pay for this thing and you'd make up your mind that was always the position we wanted to be at when we were making our pricing in comic base is we didn't want to make it simply what's the highest price you'd ever get for it if you know some drunk walked into your comic store with too much money in his hands we also don't want to make it something where you'd never close the deal so we wanted to essentially you know we want to make a pricing guide for us you know smart people spending their own money and that really influenced us from when we started to later on when we made an alliance with Comic Spire's Guide. Now, Comic Spire's Guide came along because after, you know, we looked at Wizard, we looked at several other price guides, and eventually we made a deal with uh, Maggie Thompson, Brent Frankenhoff, uh, John Jackson Miller over at uh, Comic Spire's Guide. Uh, not because they were the biggest brand in town, they, they weren't, um, but because they seemed to care about the comic field more than anyone else. Um, and also, we were kind of in the same boat. We were, you know, we were coming out of nowhere and we wanted to make a new kind of price guide. Now, back in the day, this was the early 90s, uh, Overstreet was the grand old man of the whole thing, very hip to Golden Age values. He was, you know, he actually had the kind of market power where if he said a comic book was worth X, it would become worth X, you know, that much because that would become the starting point and ending point of all discussions. If you wanted to charge much more or less than that, you'd have to justify why you weren't selling at the Overstreet price guide. We will never see a price guide with that kind of influence in our world again. Um, but that's that's the world we lived in back then. Now, there was a new kid on the block called Wizard. Wizard was making a lot of waves back then because they were very hip to the trends. Uh, Wizard would come up and say, uh, hey guys, you know, um, you know, Spawn or the new Image guys, we think they're going to be hot, you know, or Rye or Valiant or things like that. Uh, and they would be very good at pumping, you know, the, the next big thing. But frankly, they kind of sold hype a lot too. Um, we had some fun at one of our first shows that we ever did uh, selling comic books uh, where I had an extraordinary number of Dazzler number ones for sale. I had bought like 
50 of these as, you know, as a kid because I was convinced it was going to first direct market comic book, painted cover, starring the X-Men. I can't go wrong. This is the best comic ever. Uh, I, I'd gotten a, you know, a deal where it was a 50 cent comic book and I bought them for 40 cents each if I could buy 50 of them at once. Uh, needless to say, years later, I had 47 of them left for sale because this was a terrible comic book. Um, Anyway, and, and I had fun at one of my shows where I actually would go and post, you know, wizard hot pick. And, and you know, I just made it up out of whole cloth, wrote, you know, 350 for the whole thing. This thing would barely go for a buck at the time. And I actually sold several of them during the show just because the, the, you know, the hype machine of wizard was so pronounced. Uh, anyway, back in the day, and again, this is the early 90s. It was so pronounced was the gulf between these two guys that people would actually tell you to your face, hey, look, guys, you know, we, you know, we sell according to Wizard, but we buy according to Overstreet um, because you knew that was going to be quite a spread on, on newer books. Um, so, but we walked into the realm and we, you know, we didn't really want to make a, a deal with Wizard that badly. Uh, we couldn't make a deal with Overstreet. And so we thought, well, these comic buyers guys, you know, they seem like nice folks. Uh, and let's see what we can do with them. And what we did with them is we tried to create a new kind of price guide, really ga you know, gauged around that whole aspect of what would a smart person who knew comics spending their own money with some choice spend for their own stuff. Uh, and as it turns out, this led to a couple things. One, it led to an amazing amount of work. Uh, at that point, we had, you know, I, I'm going to say we'd grown the number of books in comic base up to about 50,000. And so we had to divvy up the work between uh, us over at Comic Buyer's Guide and over here at, at Human Computing. And we had to figure out what are each of these 50,000 comic books worth on that day. You do it once a year. It took months. And by the time you were done with it, you had done just crazy amounts of research. Tens of thousands of searches on eBay completed auctions and things like that, uh, surveying you know convention sales uh, and so forth. And you'd wind up with really involved opinions as to whether or not you know Dale Evans or Roy Rogers was hotter that year. Um, this was nuts. It took like three months every single time we would do a pricing update, which is, you know, if you wonder why they came out annually, <laughs> that's because it, it took that long. And that was for 50,000 books. That's as much as was in an Overstreet price guide or, or, or more even at that point. Um, because, you know, Overstreet didn't do a lot with independence and we did. Um, we also tracked a lot more creators and stuff like that. We were very proud of that. But what we were doing uh, with all this research, other than killing ourselves in terms of just the sheer amount of work with it, is we were setting the you know the the way to become the world's most unpopular price guide. Um, and that's because we didn't have the kind of, you know, again, brand definition that Overstreet had, where, you know, if Overstreet said that Four Color Comics number 148 was worth $120, you had to explain why it wasn't. Whereas we had to explain, hey, you know, we see these things and we don't see them going for more than 80. You know, if we put down 80, we'd get hate mail from the people who loved Overstreet. Uh, at the same time, anyone who had a copy of this thing would look at us and say, jerks, you know, Overstreet lists our stuff way higher and I don't like your guide as well. They would send us all sorts of nasty grams. It was no fun. Um, but the thing we really wanted to do, again, was enable commerce. We wanted to make it so if I priced it at that amount, it would actually sell. My best example from these years is uh, Conan the Barbarian, uh, 1970s adventure series. You know from Howard, you know from uh, Schwarzenegger with the movie and whatever. But uh, it was, honestly, it was a better series than it was a movie. Um, but one thing that was crazy about it at the time is Conan was one of those things that would only ever sell if you marked it down by a third. Um, it just. It, you know, for years and years of pricing it just a little too high had added up to the point where it would just, it would always be priced too high for the market. And it didn't matter where I went, I could go to Colorado and it wouldn't sell. I would go to, you know, Maine and it wouldn't sell. I'd go to California, it wouldn't sell, unless they were running a half off sale, in which case they'd clear out the section. Uh, so our take on that was, well, clearly they missed it by about a third. But as soon as you price it down by a third, you know, it's, it, you know, you get everyone mad at you. Uh, but that was where we were. Uh, we tried very hard with the whole thing and I thought we did some good work. And eventually that culminated in a, a number of things called the standard catalog comic books. Uh, still, I think the best references of comic books in printed form that we've ever seen. We won't see their like again because we've expanded the number of things we cover so far that you just can't print books on them anymore. It's it really, it, I, I knew at the time that, that the database guys were going to take over the world in the end. And, and that was the era where it was starting to happen. And so we were we were with that on it. But if you do want to read the best ever book 
reference wise about comic books look for the latest edition of standard catalog of, standard catalog of comic books uh, from Krause publications because you know I, I think that was the, the 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 crowning you know moment of that um Price guides went away in the end. We don't have a wizard price guide anymore. We don't have a comic-based price guide. We don't have a, a, a you know, funny, strangely, we do have an Overstreet price guide, but we'll get to that in a bit. Um, but for the most part, they lost their, their power. When they lost their power was about, I'm going to say about 10, 15 years ago, um, where uh, it was right for us where it ended was when uh, Krause Publications got bought out by an outfit called F and W, uh, a larger hobby-oriented uh, um, you know publisher. But one of the things they did is they ended Comic Spire's Guide, which is a great shame. Um, um, and uh, so by that point, on the other hand, we had started up a venture uh, called Atomic Avenue, where our great insight with that was, you know, we have some tens of millions of comic books that have been entered in comic base over the years. What if we gave everybody a big button mark sell and let them sell them? I'll bet you we could have more books for sale than eBay pretty quickly. Uh, and so we did that. And by that point, by the time F&W, you know, uh, decided that they were going to no longer publish Comic Spire's Guide, uh, we had been active enough with Atomic Avenue and also a later partnership we, we made with Heritage Auctions to get us high-end data on you know, Silver Age and Golden Age books that we had a really good firm source of data that we could use to talk about not what do we think the market ought to be for comics, but what is the market actually going for. Um, one of the problems with price guys is you were always in a position where you had to say, look, we're experts. We have a combined 40 years of experience or a combined 100 years of experience on staff of, of dealing with comic books. And based on everything we know, this is where we think this is going. Well, that's great. And, and it does lead to more comprehensible sets of data. Uh, one of the things it does is if you're looking down your list of, of you know, books of, of a particular title, everything would, you, you might have noticed, follows a really nice regular pattern. You know, issue number one is worth $10, number two is worth five, number three is worth, you know, $3.50, numbers, you know, you know, four through seven are worth eight, you know, $2, and, and numbers eight through, you know, 23 are worth a buck. You know, you'd see nice gradations like that. Um, that's the way price guides had always been, but they were more like the idea of a betting sheet or, or investors, bail, uh, excuse me, investors Business Daily used to run a thing where they said, well, like, you know, we think Intel ought to be going at 58 and a quarter, but we think it could go up to 60 by the end of the year. Um, that's interesting, and if you were thinking of buying Intel, you might want to take a lot of guidance from that. But I think it's even more valuable to say, look, Intel at the close of trading today sold at 48 and three quarters, right? Uh, so you had a choice with like, did you want to be, be an investment sheet? Did you want to be a buyer's guide published annually or published as often as you could? Or did you want to just say, look, dude, this is what the market went for. And our goal had always been like, you know, God, if you could ever do it, let's report what the market actually went for. Uh, Cause then that gets you out of the opinions of, you know, you, know, you should have priced my thing higher. And I say, look, I didn't make the call. It's like the market just sold it for this much. Uh, and that's a better, you know, line than, than trying to justify why your stance is better than Overstreet's stance or better than Wizard's stance or whatever else. Um, and we had to get to that point because when, you know, Congress Buyers got folded out, we no longer had the option. Um, so what we did at that point is we took with, between Heritage Auctions and um, uh, Atomic Avenue, between all the books they'd listed for sale and within a certain period of time had sold, so the actual transactions of known items, uh, we got to the point where every week we could move about two, it's actually up to about 2.1 million data points and just run a rolling average of what's uh, every single comic book just going for. Now, um, two notes on this one. First of all, this, other than being great, it, it leads to spikier data than a price guide does. It's actually really disconcerting when you first get into it because, uh, you know, where once upon a time you'd look at like a big run of, you know, later Justice Leagues and say, well, look, nothing happened in the series, like 40 issues in a row. And so they all ought to go for the same price, right? You know, there's no special artists, there's no special characters, nothing happens story-wise. Um, and you're used to saying, oh, yeah, Justice League 225 through 248 or, you know, buck each or two bucks each, whatever the thing is. Um, and instead, if you're actually reporting market data, you look at them and say, oh, you know, 240, you know, 246 went for a buck 50, 240, you know, 240. 
you know, seven went for 75 cents, 248 went, you know, went for $2.25, 248, you know, it, the, the data would bounce around a lot. Now, it, you know, it wouldn't be crazy, crazy bouncing around, but it wouldn't be the same number column after column. And that was new for people. Not generally loved, but, you know, as far as we could tell, it was the story of what actually happened today. Uh, so that was kind of neat. Um, the other part about it, though, and, and I will remember this, even though this is my second time through the story, I swear to God. Um, um, uh, oh, Lord. <laughs> uh, this is this will be the downside about fate. We'll get back to it if I recall. Um, Anyway, I'm one of the one of the things I'm gonna to have to start getting used to on doing these podcasts is don't have a really big, long, complicated train of thought, which is tends to be the way I talk and the way I, I am. If you ever you know hang out with me, uh, try to stick to nice, concrete points of view. Uh, if you have a live chat, it helps keep you a little more focused. So just tips to anyone doing a live stream. Anyway, so we were doing a, a list of of uh, actual market reports on the whole thing for the first time ever, and this was really cool for us. Um, yeah, but let's talk a little bit about how do we actually grind that data set. Because um, there's some good stuff to it and there's some bad stuff to it. So as I mentioned, uh, there were about 2 million data points we grind every week. And it works like this. Uh, we take things that people have listed a comic book for. You know, think about your those Conans I was just complaining about. You say like, oh yeah, Conan number 153. It's yeah, six bucks. That's why I want for it, right? And that counts as a vote that that comic ought to be toward that direction, right? And the more people list it like that, the more votes it has as as being worth that much money. But an actual sale of that comic book counts as it's like a shove. Uh, it's like a hard push to actually being that number. So, uh, you know, if you think about the Conan thing in particular, let's say a particular issue of Conan, uh, of Conan, you know, it always gets listed in the guides at six bucks. Everyone wants to list at six bucks, but it only ever sells for three. It might start out being listed at six bucks. When it sells for three, it might the next week fall immediately from six bucks to, you know, three dollars and seventy five cents. Um, not saying it goes straight to the the sale price, but it goes a long way toward that. Uh, and then the uh, the people who are saying I want to list at six, they're further out from that whole thing, and and their gravitational pull doesn't affect it as much. Um, another thing worth mentioning is. Uh, the sales only affect the data for a limited period of time. So think about a comic book that was optioned as part of a movie. So uh, you'd get something like, uh, let's say Spider-Man was going to get picked up, or, um, oh, oh, good grief, what was the... Uh, um, Sorry. Uh, th think of you know, a lock and key, right? So lock and key is a, a, a cover price comic book right up until... HBO or Netflix or whoever it was announces that they're going to pick it up as a series, at which point everyone's thinking, holy crap, this thing might actually get really hot, at which point lock and key number one instantly goes through the roof. It might have been out for two years ahead of time, uh, you know, uh, Umbrella Academy or, or whatever, else, same kind of story. Uh, it might have been out for two years ahead of time, people might have liked it, might have been a little over cover, whatever else, but no big deal until, oh look, Walking Dead's going to get picked up uh, you know, as, as a series and suddenly, boom, straight up. That's a really typical pattern for the comic market. Now we want to make that possible to happen, so even the fact that everyone had lock and key number one for $2.95, uh, if suddenly you see someone, you know, a whole bunch of people listing it for, you know, 10 bucks or 20 bucks. Uh, if there's enough votes that says it moves up there, you want to be able to pay attention to that. At the same time, you also want to be uh, afraid of the people who are just a little nuts, right? There's a number of people who want to spike a price one way or another. Like, I, I have a lot of this sort of thing. Uh, there was a, the whole Bugs Bunny, Elmer Fudd Wars of, uh, I want to say the uh, late 80s or early 90s, where it became like a thing, thinking that these uh, really nothing, gold key kid comics, uh, someone had said, no, 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 you're all wrong about this one. The fact that you only ever see them at garage sales for two bucks means nothing. No, these are 50 buck comics, my friends. Uh, and he was convinced of it. He convinced a number of price guys that that was the truth. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to say anyone gets things all one way, all right or all wrong, but uh, I certainly personally didn't see it that way, but at the end of the day, the market can decide. If he actually manages to sell them for 50 bucks, that's a pretty good vote for moving the price up to 50 bucks. On the other hand, if it's one lunatic who's convinced that these 
two dollar garage you know garage sale comic books are worth fifty bucks. You don't average that in to the two bucks you've got it at and come up with a price like twenty three bucks is is your price. No, you just throw the guy's data point out. You say this guy's nuts. It's way out of bounds. And the actual constant in the program you know we have for measuring uh, how much uh, out of bounds you can be before we consider you just to be an erroneous data point is it's it's called the you know the crazy threshold. And there need to be a certain number of crazy data points which agree with him before you accept any data from the crazy threshold. You don't average them in otherwise, otherwise you just throw them out. But you still have to make that low enough so that if it was low and then suddenly it gets optioned for a movie, that suddenly a lot of people voting the same way can instantly move the thing that way. So that's the balance that we've always been trying to make with comic bases. How do you make it so prices can move fast enough to reflect the market, while well, at the same time not letting just anybody who has a lunatic idea of how things work affect the market by listing their comic books in a weird way. Now, uh, let's talk about, uh, well, first of all, I'll give you the good and I'll give you the bad. The good news is it got us out of the pricing game. Um, I no longer had to spend months of my life pricing comic books, making up my own ideas about, you know, whether Dale, you know, uh, Dale Evans was hot that year or whether Buck Rogers was, he was really the man. Um, uh, I'm, I'm getting that wrong. Buck Rogers is, is the space guy. Who... At some point, if we, if we had the live stream going, I, I'd be able to say, Buck, not Buck Owens, Buck, yeah, the other cowboy, my bad. Anyway, um, but yes, you used to have to have really, you know, complicated thoughts about, you know, what the right pricing stance was. I no longer need to do this one. As a result, um, it's now 10, 15 years after I've had to do that kind of work, and I don't know what anything's worth anymore. I, I It's not part of my life anymore. Uh, as a result, even though I sell all my comic books, I sell 60,000 comic books on Atomic Avenue, I'm constantly being surprised by things that are happening. I was like, ah, I didn't know that was you know hot. You know, There'd be a comic book where I'd find out it got hot the moment I just sold all my copies because you know, it instantly jumped up to, you know, uh, you know, some price because it got an option for some movie or whatever else. Um, now, we update weekly. Weekly is good. Uh, oftentimes on Atomic Avenue, I'm the guy who had his, you know, stuff listed for two bucks. I wasn't listening to E! Entertainment when the announcement for the new show came down. And so two things happen. One, I sell all my copies for the two bucks that they were. I feel, hey, I feel pretty good. I only paid a buck for them, so I made I made half my money again. Uh, and then some other guy on Atomic Avenue the next week, uh, after they've cleared out everybody who had it mar at two bucks, will sell his at 20 bucks, and he'll feel like a real, you know, king of the, of the whole domain. Um, and that's great. But the cool thing is for me is I feel like we still won because it found its way to 20 bucks without me telling it anything. I didn't have to be the one who told that, the market told it that. So actual real sales activity moved it. So that part's really freaking cool. Let's talk about where it all falls apart. Um, I mentioned right now we have about 2.1 million data points we grab, you know, we grab every week to talk about, you know, how we, you know, do our pricing on comic base. Uh, we have some, at the moment, I, I want to say we have just north of 876,000 comic books in the database. 2.1 million data sales points per week isn't enough. Um, it's pretty darn good. It's more than anyone else has got by a long chalk. And we're actually talking about verified sales and verified things for, for sale, you know, for the same comic books. Um, as opposed to, say, like if you were to go to Nightwing, where not only do they have not nearly as many things listed, but if you say, oh, I sold Nightwing 17, it's anyone's guess as to what condition was in. If you say Nightwing 17, did you mean first series, second series, third series, fourth series, fifth series? It's impossible to get all that data aggregated in, in a sufficient way to kind of come up with the kind of pricing stance on what everything was worth. Um, not not for everything, not, not for the breadth of comic books we cover here. That said, it's still not enough because there's going to be some things like uh, cable number one, if you guys remember that from the early 90s, you know, when uh, 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 Liefeld got super hot and they, you know, we were handing him a series right and left and uh, he was drawing guys with, you know, arms as big as their heads and so forth. Um, that thing sold a jillion copies. There are a jillion people as a result who have copies of them they would love to get rid of because it wasn't that good a comic book. Um, and you will see on any given week that there might be 50 sales transactions involving cable number one alone. Um, but on the other hand, if you took True Romance 54, uh, there might be zero tra uh, sales transactions in a whole month. Uh, some of these forgotten, you know, romance and, and adventure comic books from the 50s, they come up once in a blue moon. So 
there isn't enough data to fully measure, you know, where their stance is. I mean, I, I feel like our stance on cable number one is really dialed in. We probably got it within a couple cents of its of its actual market value at any given moment because there's so much data on it. But things where there's not much data or, and then here's the other complicating factor, where there's really big jackpot multiples of the price uh, or the grade um, uh, can affect things in a way that isn't great, especially if there isn't a lot of data to countervail it. So let me show you a few things in Counterbase right now. So let me put on my glasses at once. Um, so switching over to screen two. Um, all right, so here we have Fantastic Four. Now, you guys might have noticed here under the setup menu, we have a thing called grading setup. And let me bring it over to the same window. All right, so near mint is our gold standard. Everything we, we grade, you know, one of the, the secrets of comic base is those 2.1 million data points are all calibrated against near mint. They're not calibrated against all the potential grades it could have, it's all calibrated against near mint. So when you are looking at, um, you know, cable number one, we're, we're good. But let's say that you sold a comic book, and let's go down the line here, and these are all based on statistical averages of where things typically, if the near mint price was, was X, with, you know, with the very fine price is typically 66% of X or thereabouts. Uh, There's a lot of uh, debate in the early days as to whether it ought to be 75% or 70%. Uh, we took the more conservative stance of 66%. Uh, similarly with fine, once upon a time, if you look at old grading guides, you see that listed as 40 or 45% of near mint. Uh, we had it 33%, very good, 20 and so forth. Um, uh, poor, if you look at that one, 2% of near mint. So if I have a poor copy of Action Comics number one, uh, Action Comics number one is currently going for about $3 million. Uh, in theory, a poor copy, which means one where I, I could have ripped I, I could remove, you know, rip the half the cover off, you know, and soak the rest of it in water. Um, uh, would still be worth two percent of of that kind of money. Uh, so here's where this gets really bad for us. Oh, actually, let me let me talk a little bit more about graded comic books first. Another thing that came along in the early '90s was the advent of graded comic books. This is something that, that started out in the fields of um, uh, things like stamps and uh, coins, and eventually came into comic books with. Um, the Collector's Guarantee Corporation, or CGC. And the idea is, we will take a comic book, and uh, you and I can agree on what the grade is. Um, you say, all right, that is a near mint. And they would say, that's a 9.4. That's their version of near mint. And I say, okay. Uh, okay, it's currently going for 50 bucks near mint. All right, we, we got a deal, 50 bucks. And they say, ah, wait a minute here. You send it over to the Collector's Guarantee Corporation. They handle the same comic book. And they say, all right. They sent back to you in a sealed, you know, in a sealed uh, capsule with a label on it, which says, you know, whatever the name of the comic book is, Near Mint 9.4, officially. And then I say, okay, yeah, that's great. It's in plastic now, so 50 bucks, right? And they say, ah, no, 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 200 bucks. And this, if you if you start you know, if you're dealing with graded comic books in the early 90s when this first came out. This made you nuts. You could not believe that this was going on, and certainly only a few fools would, would work this way. It's like, wait, how can we both agree on the grade? We're both expert people. We both understand what the thing is, and you're saying if sticking it in plastic makes it worth four times as much. Except that, uh, you know, us and the folks over Comics Buyer's Guide reviewed every single eBay transaction that could be found. Uh, I want to say it was a number like 30,000 you know, transactions on eBay. And we found that not only were you seeing multiples like this happening for near mint, like it would go for 400% of the, uh, a slabbed near mint comic book would re would regularly sell for 400 400% of the near mint unslabbed, you know, thing, but it was reproducible. Uh, there was a time when Comics Guarantee Corporation was actually, you know, using this in an ad where they would say, here is Vampirella unslabbed, here's what it's good for, here's what it just sold for slabbed, and it would, and it would regularly indicate the same kind of multiples. Now, let's have a look at the screen here, and, because these multiples are something else, uh, and I'm going to go ahead and actually use the magnification thing that I finally think I got working a little bit. Um, that's a little much. All right. Hopefully you guys can all see that. So let's have a look at uh, CGC and let's start with 9.4. So 9.4 means near mint. It's worth four. You know, so, but what this says here is that your average 
CGC 9.4 comic book is going to sell for four times what the unslabbed near mint price would sell for. Uh, if it was just a little less good, a very fine plus, right, or a near mint minus, it's still worth two and a half times as much. You know, um, it's only when you get down to essentially very fine CGC 8.5 that that you start hitting the same kind of numbers that you know you're used to seeing for unslabbed comic books. And at that point, it tightens up quite a bit. Um, there's the, the kind of jackpot you get for slabbing a, a comic book on CGC really falls off at that after that point. But let's look at something else. Uh, there's another phenomenon in the field that, man, I, I sure didn't see this one coming, which is the idea of jackpot grades. Uh, there are people in the world who need to have the very best something you know they might need to have the world's most attractive woman on their arm you know, as their wife they might need to have the world's biggest diamond for their engagement ring they might need to have the world's sportiest car and some people got to have the world's best copy of dazzler number one um in this case you can actually say cgc 10.0 which essentially means flawless it means mint now if you look at what Mint typically brings up in a conventional grading guide, uh, and I'll zoom this out a little bit so we can get to it, Mint in a conventional grading guide brings only a modest premium, 105%, right? Because what does Mint mean? Mint means it looks newsstand fresh, except, eh, the printing's perfect. Staples, they look great. You know, I see no fingerprints on it anywhere at all. I mean, it looks newsstand fresh, but really a beautiful copy of newsstand fresh. Back in the day, there'd be a couple people who would care. Um, in this world where you're dealing with the people who have to have the absolute certified best, they don't just care. They are willing to pay 28 times on average as much to have the very best known copy of something, or, or at the very least, an absolutely certified flawless uh, copy of that. Now, something as you said about graded comic books, um, they they're interesting in that you know, I mentioned that whole thing where like you know you and I could agree on what a nine point four comic book is worth, you know, fifty bucks, and as soon as you slab it, you want to charge two hundred bucks for it. When that happens once or twice, it's a fluke, or it's a you're dealing with a weirdo, or you're dealing with whatever else. When it happens again and again and again and again and again, you know, over the years, over different locations, over different buyers and sellers, then you eventually start realizing something else is going on here. And it could be that what we're doing is we're removing doubt from the market. Maybe what we're doing is, you know, it's just shinier because it's in plastic. Maybe it feels like it's eternal because it's encased in something so solid. But what you're really doing when it comes down to it is you're manufacturing a new collectible. You're, you're, not, you're not taking a comic book and putting it in plastic and treating it as if it's a plastic thing with, that's verified to be a certain grade. That's what it claims to be. But what's actually, at least as far as the market is concerned, what's actually happening, this, it's worth restating, is you're actually manufacturing a new collectible, uh, which different types of people will buy. And they'll buy them for different reasons. And, but its raw ingredients are a comic book. But it really does track as if it were a completely different sort of thing. Uh, people will buy CGC comic books that wouldn't touch regular comic books. People will pay, in the comic market, will pay great premiums for CGC comic books, even though they themselves are expert graders and know the, and know the grade to be a certain thing. Um, so it's, it's maddening until you kind of realize that that's really what's going on. Um, but let's get back to the whole idea of what's going on with pricing. So if you want the pricing in comic base to be wrong, right, despite everything we're doing to try to make it right, if you want it to be wrong, the golden, the golden way you get there is to have a comic book without a lot of data on it, right? So a, not a lot of sales transactions, because if there were a lot of sales transactions, one weird one would get canceled out by, you know, other regular ones. Um, so without a lot of sales transactions, and preferably one with a really big multiplier attached to it, either it's a really terrible comic book like a poor, or it's a really great comic book like a CGC 10, and have it go for just a little bit outside of the regular bounds of what you'd expect. Uh, so let's take, you know, let's take that, uh, let's switch back the screen here, and let's take the idea of a comic book that, uh, uh, let's dial it back here, to just poor, right? A lot of people are never going to lay their hands on an Action Comics number one. That, I'm, I dare say that's most of us, even though there were, I want to say, almost, you know, a couple million of them printed. Um, uh, it's funny, it's, it's, 
it's one of those time machine kinds of questions. Or like, if you could go back in time and do, you know, do you kill baby Hitler? Or in my case, or at least as a comic collector, yeah, that might be nice to do. But honestly, in 1938, I, I want to say in August, uh, the first thing I want to do is take just a dollar and go to a newsstand and buy 10 copies of Action Number One. <laughs> anyway, um, but a lot of people are never going to lay their hands on Action Comics Number One in Near Mint. Uh, there are thought to be only four in existence. Uh, uh, I'll tell you one story I didn't tell the first time around. Uh, I got a call. I'm sitting at my desk. You know, I'm, I'm back in California, and I get a call from some English gentleman, and he says, "It's like, uh, yeah, hello. I'd like to talk to someone about, you know, about your comic pricing." And you know, and I've got the whole spiel ready to go. And I say, "Well, you know, it's really set by the market." And he said, "Well, yeah, it's more of a go problem. Action number one. Now, the action number one. Go to the spiel part B, where you say, look, there's." Only a couple of those in, in you know in your mint in the world they go for whatever they go for our price is whatever it sold for last time at Christie's that's the long and the short of it and he says you know and, and I, I have no idea what we had it for at the moment in kind of case might have been a million and a quarter or something and he says well I don't think your price is right so no well, you know buddy it's 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 like we go by whatever the latest Christie's auction report is on the whole thing you know there are only four of them it's an esoteric argument it's it's there's not enough of them to worry about and he goes well it, it's only I've got one. <laughs> and and you find out later he'd been managing the estate of one Nicholas Cage and, and that later on got passed on to Lisa Marie in the divorce and so forth but he was actually quite concerned he was very nice about it <laughs> but uh, uh, he was quite concerned about our, our pricing on Action 1 but um, for the most of us we're not going to have that particular problem um, but we might someday there might be a guy who for 20,000 bucks will let us get our hands on a copy of Action Number 1 in poor. You know, the one of the ones that's been stuck up in the attic and is brown to a cinder and, you know, and is barely readable, you know, because of all the foo on it. Um, but, you know, for a lot of people, 20000 bucks that's as close as they're ever going to get to that piece of history. And that's completely understandable. Um, but if we say that the book ought to go for $2 million, so 2% of, of, of that is $40,000. Let's say he only pays $20,000 for it, right? And let's say further, that's the only sale of Action Comics, you know, that happens during that whole month, Action Comics number one. Well, the price of Action Comics number one is going to take a real hit because we have a verified sale now, but it's in poor, where there's a 50-time differential between the near mint price and the the you know the grade he brought it bought it in. Similarly, if you uh, have a comic book that quite could be quite ordinary, Dazzler number one, right? Which you know, let's say it's going for you know, let's make the numbers easy on myself, uh, ten dollars. You know, it isn't, but you know, let's say it is. Uh, you know, and so we we think it ought to go for. Uh, I hope I have the story. Two hundred eighty dollars in a CGC ten point oh, which again would still be an epic waste of your money. Um, but let's say you know, it, let's say it, it sells for you know five hundred dollars let's in 10.0 because he really really wanted it well let's say it sells for a hundred dollars in 10.0 either of those moves is going to move the price dramatically at least in the very short term now what will happen very shortly is the next copy will hit the market, or the next copy will be posted for sale in most of these cases, and it'll knock it right back to where it should have been. But you can see the spike, and the spike is justified based on the sales data, but, you know, it can get a little weird. Um, so that's the limits of, I mean, when you, when you do take a kind of a thumbs off the scale kind of approach to pricing, that's the thing you got to watch out for. Now, as I mentioned before, we do have the idea where you disregard things that are really outside the norm. Um, so, you know, there is a limit on sales that just seem crazy. You know, it's like, uh, you know, I had a mansion. It was a million dollars, but I sold to my brother for a dollar. You don't treat that as a transaction, right? Even though it's a real sale, right? But it seems so far out of the line, we don't treat it that way. Uh, similarly, if I took my copy of Dazzler number one and I said, it's a million dollars, you don't treat that one seriously. You just throw the data point out. But, you know, uh, on the other hand, again, things can stack up. They can get, you know, you can have enough people who are close enough to where it ought to be where it starts moving the price to a place it maybe ought not to be. Um, so we've thought about this, and we've taken some steps in the latest versions of Copies to try to really be more proactive about addressing this. Because, you know, again, we're very database, and the cure for almost everything that happens wrong with the pricing of Copies is more data. It, it solves itself. Uh, much the same way that I'm always being surprised by things that got picked up by movies, because I find out about them because the, the price moved, and I didn't know about them. Um, but you also can have things that, like, they got knocked out of some crazy level, and then it didn't sell, and it didn't sell, and it didn't sell, and then someone sold one for a real price and then bam straight back to the regular price 
Um, that works, but in the meantime, if you're looking at some comic book, and it just seems weird. It's like, ah, what the heck is Daffy Duck number 27 doing for $180? Because somehow a cabal of weirdos got together and, and somehow it got there. Or or somebody bought a poor copy for 10 bucks because it, it, it reminded them of their cousin and they just had to have it. Whatever the thing is. Weird stuff can creep in, and if there's no further sales of that same comic book to knock them back in, they can just sit there in the guide and look weird. Well, we did do something to help you with that, and we flip you back to this one and show it to you. Um, actually, I guess we've been on that view the entire time. Uh, sorry about that. We've been staring at the screen. Um, I never said I was good at this whole video switching thing, but I'm getting better, I think, maybe a little. All right, so, but what you, one thing you can do is you can come down here, and let's say I've got a Fantastic Four number two. Fantastic Four number two right now, 8,200 bucks, first appearance of the Skrulls, cool. Um, but let's say I think that this really ought to be 10,000 bucks, and I'm sure of it for some reason. One thing I can do is I can go highlight the issue right here, and then come up under the internet menu here, and say request price check. And what that's going to do is it's going to actually, you know, is it's going to say, all right, guys, short recap of how we get our pricing to start with, which is to say, look, we don't normally reprice things, but if you think something weird happened, this is when you essentially get to ask our man our editors for a manual review. So what we're going to do is to say, look, it's currently hit you two hundred bucks. What do you think it ought to be? And you can say, look, I think this thing is worth twelve thousand bucks easy, and then we're going to say. Why do you think that? And what we want to hear is we want to hear something like, I just sold one for 12,000 bucks, or, you know, I've, I've been looking one for years and I've never seen it for less than $12,000, or, you know, uh, or I'm, a, I'm one of the world's preeminent, you know, you know uh, scholars of, 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 of that particular issue. Whatever the answer is, we want to hear that it comes from some kind of experience that you had. What we don't want to hear is because I read it in Overstreet, or I read it in, in Bob's Price Guide, or Joe's Price Guide, or whatever the thing is. Uh, we want to hear that it comes from some kind of knowledge you've got. Um, so if you give, uh, uh, give that to us, it sends it to us, our editors, and then what we're going to do is we're going to take that as a project, and we're going to then scour every available price source we can get our hands on. We'll look at auction results, we'll look at eBay, you know, things, we'll look at, you know, uh, the sorts of data feeds we wouldn't normally be looking at at all, and we'll try to figure out what the truth is. At which point, if we do figure out that it's worth that, we're going to do two things. One is, is we will do that rare step of actually, again, knocking it straight to that price. There won't be a little nudge in the whole thing. It's like, nope. You know, whatever the right price is, we're going to you know, manually set it. And then we'll probably lock it down for a month or so until it settles out of the system. Um, because a lot of people will price based on what we priced. And if, you know, and we want to give it time for, uh, if they're doing that, for them to adjust their prices to match our new guide price. And then the whole thing rolls on again. Um, so there is the idea of a price check on the whole thing. So... All right, that's a lot about pricing right now. I want to mention a couple things I didn't mention the first time out, and then I want to talk about it. Let's talk about the whole issue of selling. Um, so first thing I want to mention is one of the biggest questions we get with comic base is, what's the deal with the red and the blue? Right, so you might have noticed that these guys over here, um, you know, the, the third printing of of, uh, of uh, Fantastic Four number one, it's uh, seventy five bucks now, and it's blue. Uh, the first one is uh, fifty four thousand dollars, and it's blue. And all the blue means is it went down in value. Uh, it's it's uh, kind of a callback to the old, uh, if you remember, the hot and cold, you know, from Wizard back in the day. Um, what the red means is that it went up significantly in value. Not just that it went up, but it went up in a way you'd notice it. I think it's numbers like 6% or better uh, over the last year. And then the question is, what do the, what do the black ones mean? Eh, it just means they were close to being the same as last year's price. So it's just a really quick way of knowing, you know, what's the action on this particular issue? Where's it going? Um, that's the first thing about that. Um, and now let's talk about how do we sell our comic books? How do we get the money that, that these things are allegedly worth, you know, out at the end of the day? All right, so switching back to something where you can actually see myself. Um, with comic books, as I mentioned before, you kind of got a trade-off you're making um, between um, time and money. Uh, once again, if what you've got in your collection is nothing but a set of absolutely virgin Tales from the Crypts or, you know, or a, you know Action Comics 1 through 100 or something like that, you don't have this problem. You can just go to any auction house and they will, you know, gladly make this happen for you. It'll happen instantly. Um, for the rest of us, uh, the people with more normal collections, I mean, we have some good stuff, maybe we have some bad stuff, but let's say we got, let's say our collection does not consist purely of high-grade golden age. Um, 
what I would personally recommend, and, and the advice I'm giving you here is basically what what would I tell a friend, right? You know, it isn't you know some of this is going to come off as self-interested because we are tied into some of these things. I'll tell you when we are, but I'm I'm honestly going to tell you like if if you were just a buddy and I was telling you what you know what position are you in and how can you make the most money for it, this is how I would steer you. If you had, uh, you know, so uh, this, uh, let me point you back to my copy of comic books. So this thing here is, is a, a copy of my actual comic books. If you've got an actually great collection, you know, so you have lots and lots of very expensive things. Uh, you've got, you've got that Fantastic Four number one. You've got that action number, you know, 247, whatever the thing is. Um, my first thing I would try, because it costs nothing to try it, is I'd come up under here and I would say request collection evaluation. And let me see if I can make that, see if I can make that bigger. I'm just, I'm in love with the idea of, of, of making these things large enough to actually see on screen. All right, so come up here under the internet menu and say request collection evaluation. What that's going to do, and it's going to do it very quickly on mine in half, is it's going to look through your collection and it's going to say, does this guy have the kind of collection that Heritage Auction Galleries, one of the largest auction galleries in the world for comic books, would be interested in representing? Uh, and if you do it online, you're going to very quickly get this news, which is to say, yeah, forget about it, Bickford. Um, you know, it's just, yeah, you're not really for us. Uh, honestly, Heritage Auctions doesn't really much care about comic books that are worth less than 500 bucks. That's almost everything I own. Um, you know, neither here nor there, it's just what, what I've got. Um, but if you have the kind of collection they, they, they're they interested in, which is to say you have a, either a number of very high dollar value, you know, comic books, or you've got a number of of books that, uh, or you've got a whole lot of pretty high value books. If you're, if you get a different message off of that, which says, uh, yeah, actually, this looks like it might be a good fit for Heritage, I would definitely go for it. Um, the reason is because Heritage Auction Gallery is going to do stuff for your books that no one else can do. Um, they're going to basically, you know, they're going to ask. It's going to ask your permission to send a, a pressy of your collection you know, of your of your best books over to the head of acquisitions over at Heritage Auctions. Go straight on his desk. He'll probably give you a call within a day or two saying, "Hey, this sounds pretty good." And don't be surprised if a guy gets on a plane and is flying out to your place. You know, within a couple of days. Um, I've I've had this happen to a number of friends of mine, and I've been jealous. But you know, it's been great for them uh, because what they do then is they say, "Oh, I'm going to look through your 10,000 comic books, and here's the 300 I really, really, really." want. They'll take those 300 out, they will get them slabbed if they need to in order to sell them, they'll mark them up in the auction catalog, they'll an advertise them even internationally on the whole thing, and you're going to make bank. It's it's going to be, you're going to do so much better in that format than in any conventional format. I have no hesitation in recommending it to you at all. Um, just to confess my own back end of it, we get a couple percent as a recommendation on the whole thing. But same thing if you were recommending it to one of your buddies uh, to go to you know heritage auctions, you would also get you know uh, you know a couple percent if you were a previous customer. Um, that said, you know, hey, I got kids in college. If you know you make a lot of money yourself and you you know put my kid through a semester, it wouldn't kill me. Just saying. Um, but anyway, if I had that kind of collection, that would absolutely be the way I would go first. All right, now, as I mentioned, I don't have that kind of collection. I got a whole bunch of stuff that, you know, I think it's pretty cool, but it's, you know, it's not all that necessarily. I've got some books that are worth a few hundred bucks. I've got a whole ton of books that are worth five bucks. Uh, what do I do? Well, if I've got some time on my hands, you know, to deal with it, my my go-to way, if you own comic base already, is get your stuff inventoried and post it on Atomic Avenue, is what I would definitely suggest to you. Um, the reason is this. Atomic Avenue has a couple things going for it that uh, other places don't that make it really cool for folks who are in this particular position. One is they have no listing fees. Uh, it costs nothing to put your stuff out there. You only pay if something sells. Uh, it's, it's a commission like 15% and that includes all your financial charges, you know, a lot of the credit card stuff that usually gets you know, rolled in afterwards on eBay or stuff like that. Um, it's it, the lowest fees of any of the competitive joints, you know, going out there. Um, it doesn't have, uh, you know, if you have like say books or something like that, you know how Amazon.com, you know, you can definitely post your used copy of whatever it is you read 
and you'll, it'll definitely sell, even if, if it's for a penny. Hopefully you make up some money on the shipping. It'll definitely sell because they have a ton of people looking at it, but man, the seller fees are just a killer. They can be like 25, 30%. Um, Atomic Cabin, very reasonable, and I love the idea that you pay nothing until something moves. Uh, so a lot of people actually will even do the thing where they'll list on multiple places, including Atomic Avenue. The other reason you want to go with Atomic Avenue, or at least I would do it, is because listing your stuff on Atomic Avenue takes like no effort. Uh, the, the integration is built into Comic Base, uh, and it goes like this. Uh, let me switch over to the screen here. Get out of magnify mode. So let's say I want to list something on Atomic Avenue. Um, the idea is is you instantly get your own uh, storefront. All you got to do is you know double click on an issue. I'll bring it over to that screen so we can look at it. And you might see this thing over here. It says for sale down at the bottom. If you mark your book as for sale and you have one to sell, um, that's all you got to do. Mark it that way and you can add it to your store on Atomic Avenue. Or better yet, if you have a bunch of books for sale, highlight a bunch like this, come under the items menu, I'm sorry, the edit menu, and say quick change. Bring it over to the right screen. Go down here, click for sale, mark is checked, make changes, and it'll mark for sale across the, all six of those. Or best of all, if you, let's say you're like me and you say, look, anything I've got in my whole collection that I've, you know, you know, is it's, you're, you're welcome to have it, you know, as long as you pay me what my going price is. At that point, what I would do is I would just go under here and I would say mass change. Mass change is one of these commands that like never gets used because, yeah, honestly, you shouldn't use it much. This is for making changes across the entire database. And what this is for and is perfect is something like this where you say, look, for every single thing I've got for sale, set the value, is checked. I make changes and then in a couple seconds, it'll make it across all 800 some thousand you know books in the entire database and I don't need to worry about marking for sale again if I have one in stock and I post it for sale it'll go up at that point with everything marked as for sale you've already got the price set that's what the price field is right here so if I want to sell it for you know say I, let's say I've got one of these right here and I want to sell it not for $49 but for 60 bucks yeah change the price and then come up under here and all I got to do is say post items for sale on Atomic Avenue it's going to then say, okay, uh, give me some options about whether I want to offer free shipping or international shipping, or whether I'll need to collect sales tax, uh, and so forth. I say post inventory, all 60,458 items will go up for sale within a few minutes. Um, it couldn't be simpler. Uh, so, um, and then what happens after that point is, depending on what you've got, uh, you know, if there are people who have been waiting for particular books you have for sale, they're going to get automatically notified via mailing list um, uh, thing. Uh, I'd say for people, particularly if you're posting cool books from the 80s and back, a lot of people just tons and tons of mail list triggers just waiting to go off. So don't be surprised if you get a lot of action just the first time you post your stuff. Um, um, anyway, what happens then is the model is very much exactly like Amazon's used books, uh, where basically, uh, you know, you basically say, I have this thing for sale for X amount of money. People say, yeah, okay, I bought it. They bought it, you know, they, they pay Amazon for it. You get a note saying you sold this thing, go mail it to this guy. You're getting a note saying you've just sold the following books, go mail them to this guy. You mail them off, two weeks later you get you know money sent to you via electronic. Um, minus, it's like a 15% commission fee. Have a look at Atomic Avenue, it'll give you all the seller rates on the whole thing, but it's it's a cool way to go in. It works great, especially if you're selling weird ass stuff you never thought would ever move. Um, you know, you know, it is, you know, if you've got some time. Um, so, uh, good and the bad. Uh, good. Don't pay anything unless it moves. Bad is it's not great for clearing out whole collections. I mean, I'll, I'll just be straight up with the whole thing. If I got, and I do, 60,000 kind of weird things from all over the place, my normal day uh, starts with me, you know, basically coming into my office. I look at what's sold on Atomic Avenue overnight. I print off a bunch of, uh, you know, mailings, you know, stuff. I go, you know, pull them, box them up, send them out with the rest of the packages going out for that day. And over the course of the week, I'll make a few hundred bucks. And that's, you know, cool. I mean, sometimes I make a lot of money. Sometimes I make, you know, just a couple hundred bucks. But, but I mean, it's that's great for me because it's a nice steady churn of stuff going on. And I'm always kind of looking at stuff saying, whoa, dude, someone paid that for that? No way. Um, you know, and... It's if you guys are familiar with the concept of the long tail, uh, this is super long tail stuff. It's like you had no idea someone was looking for Dazzler number twenty three that hard. I mean, it it never would have occurred to you, um, but when someone does, you're gonna sell it to them. 
that's the good news. The bad news is, like I say, hard to clear out whole collections. So if, let's say you've got a different collection uh, set of problem, you know, you're just tired or you inherited a bunch of comic books, you just want to let them move. Um, you know, at that point, I would actually, if it were me, I'd, I'd pursue those strategies in sequence. I would start with Heritage, get rid of the top dollar stuff if I possibly could. Atomic Avenue to get rid of stuff that moves somewhat, you know, quickly. Because remember, you're getting, you're selling everything at your full list price at that point. You're not giving up anything. You're getting 100% of your asking on that one, um, you know. And then you got to start, you know, uh, you got to start thinking, how do I blow stuff out at bulk? Now the bulk market gets brutal, and there's no way to sugarcoat this one. What you want to do there is you want to, as much as is reasonable for you, you want to trade information about the comic books for value because you don't have time to waste right you gotta you gotta clear it out you, you're hoping you're at the end of the day someone's gonna walk up to your house with a big van or a moving truck or whatever it is and a bunch of strong guys and take a bunch of comic books out and hand you a check that's that's your end goal right um, so that's gonna happen on the time frame you want but it'll happen one of two different ways if I post an ad on Craigslist that says I have a thousand comics for sale right if you know nothing at all about a thousand comics, right? And it, like if I call them up and say, let's let's say I, I say, I'll, I'll go one better. It's a thousand comics and they're in good shape, right? If you know nothing else about that, the number you ought to be guessing for what that's worth is 5,000 bucks. You know, five bucks a comic is the average for a comic I know nothing about from today. Now, you can move that number up, right? Well, you can also move it down. Let's talk about that one first. If I say, what kind of shape they're in, you say, I don't know, right? At that point, the guess becomes they're worth about 20% of near mint uh, because the average grade from, I don't know, is about good, uh, which means that suddenly your thousand comic, uh, dollar, uh, thousand comic books isn't worth $5,000, it's worth $1,000. If so, if you just want to post them on Craigslist, I got a thousand comics, come pick them up and that's all you tell someone that's the ballpark you're working in right now they might want them for 500 bucks they might want them for 1500 bucks but that's kind of the ballpark um now you can trade them information to get more money right but that requires a little bit of time on your end and so calibrate your needs accordingly if for instance the very first piece of information i gave you is like what condition are they in? if you could say with certainty they're near mint then suddenly you're in a much stronger place. Suddenly you're at that five thousand, you know, five dollars per comic market. But let's say you could tell me more. Let's say, yeah, they're mostly from the '80s and before. You know, my dad used to collect, but he stopped in the '80s. Well, when did he start collecting? Uh, you know, from the '60s. Oh, well, now this suddenly got really interesting to people because now my guesstimate for what these things are worth it isn't five bucks a comic. Now it's more like fifteen bucks a comic. Right, depending on what, how much of this, if it's is the '60s and how much of it is the '80s. If I know for instance, like yeah, my dad he was really big collecting comic books in the '40s. Suddenly, I start guessing in the hundreds of bucks per comic, depending on condition. And at that point, everyone they're not they're not sitting at home talking to you anymore. They're already in their car driving to you. Um, so the more information you can give them about what you've got, the better it gets. Now, it gets really good if you can tell them, look, it is, they're not just mostly from the 80s, and they're not mostly in this condition, but no, here's an actual list of the comics. And that's why, look, get a copy of Comic Base. I don't care if it's the free version. Get a copy of something and go through each one and, and list what you've actually got. And, uh, you know, so go through and say, look, I have, you know, Fantastic Four number nine. It is in VG condition and I know it for sure. Um, and actually, you know, and actually mark things as what they actually are and so forth. Because at that point, you're going to give people a very, very good idea for what you've got. You're taking away their uncertainty and you're increasing the money that they will give you. Uh, because the more uncertain you give them, the more they're going to assume that you have something bad. Uh, they're not going to, nobody, <laughs> nobody assumes that, oh yeah, you're not going to tell me what it is. I'm going to assume it's the best possible one, right? Um, but if I say, no, I've got a number, uh, that one ends in VG. And if I can prove that I'm good at grading, then I I, I also get more credit for, uh, you know, uh, for being honest about that. Let's talk a little bit about grading because it's the most important thing you can do when you're, you know, doing comic books. A lot of people call up and they say, look, I, I don't know comic grading from whatever, you know, they all look pretty good to me. Uh, th that puts you again in that 20% ungraded kind of category in terms of what people are going to guess your books are worth. It's really, really worth going through things and spending a day or spending two days or whatever it takes to get good at grading. But if you don't know how to do it, there's a really easy way. And it has to do with this guy right over here. When you double click on a comic book, and you see the grade. 
you see this little question mark right next to it? What that means, that, that brings up the grading wizard. That's the I don't know, lead me through it button. All right, so I'm going to click on that. And let's have a look at the grading wizard. Bring that over onto the screen. All right, all this does is this is an encapsulation of the Overstreet price, you know, you know, comic grading guide. This is the industry standard. Um, so what you've got to do here is just look at the comic and say, all right, what's wrong with it? Uh, and so you look and say, yeah, I don't know, man. I, I see a little tear in the corner. I say, okay, great. So uh, how big is the tear? And so you say, well, you know, it's uh, about a half an inch, you know, a half an inch on the cover. Okay, it's by the staples. Okay, great. So that immediately this thing went from very fine to very good. All right, I so see what else is wrong with it. Oh, uh, well, cover gloss. Eh, it's not so good. It's got some smudges on it. Uh, Moderate, okay. Notice that moderate didn't change the uh, didn't change the grade at all. If we look down here at the uh, at the estimated grade, it's still very good. Moderate didn't have anything to do with it. If I go to none at all, you know, if I've I've if I've taken it to a sander and wiped off every bit of, of gloss on the cover, I, I guess I can reduce it to good just by doing that. But that's a pretty rare defect. Uh, but let's say uh, yeah, somebody wrote on the cover. This is one of the weird ones that uh, there's a lot of. Uh, um, this is a somewhat controversial stance, but it's accepted, but, but people aren't happy about it. Uh, is uh, Overstreet uh, treats uh, date stamps and initials on the cover as, as being almost not a defect. Uh, let's say I remove the, um, the other defects on this one. Something with date stamps on, on, the, on, the, on the comic right here can still be very fine. Um, which, to me, that's crazy, but for if you grew up in the era of newsstands, I guess that was normal. Um, uh, on the other hand, uh, the other controversial one on here is if you look at staples. Uh, let's have a look over here. Uh, I knew a guy um, who had a high-grade, absolutely virgin, 1950s shadow comic. Uh, uh, shadow comics. These are just gorgeous, really hard to find pulp books. And he was going to move, and he took them outside, and he just he didn't move, he didn't put a tarp over the table. He left them outside on the table overnight, and the staples two days later all acquired rust. Still perfect comics, still full glossy, still beautiful, but a rusted staple on these things just that defect alone had reduced it to good, very good. It 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 had shaved off about eighty percent of the value of the comics overnight. It was insane. Um, anyway, so uh, have a look at the grading wizard. Get used to it, knowing what sorts of defects you see a lot and what sorts of impact that will have on the on the on the grade. You're going to get very quick with this very fast. You'll be like, oh yeah, okay, I got you know half inch tear here in the cover bend, boom, very good. You know, move on, boom, done. You apply the grade. It gets written onto the whole thing. It moves the grade down here. It applies it. It will write down if in the grading notes uh, as to what happened, uh, and you're in really good shape. But take the time to get good at grading. Uh, it's going to pay off hugely as as you come to evaluate your collection. When you're all done with it, uh, and this is assuming once again, I want to just dump my collection. I, I want to just I want to put it out for sale from the highest bidder can take it. You know, pull up with a moving van. If it were me, and I had a copy of Comic Base uh, uh, Archive or Pro. I would be going down to the export menu over here. So under the file menu, right over here, go to export. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna bring up a dialogue over on the other screen, of course. Um, and it'll basically say, what fields do I wanna show? And I'm gonna say, yeah, show the title, the issue, the condition, the quantity, and uh, maybe I'll put in the, uh, I don't know, you know, the, the notes and the grading notes and uh, the price. So, you know, the person I'm selling has an idea for what it is. What this is gonna do then is, is write out, in just a couple seconds, it'll write out a text file with everything that's in that collection that's for sale. Um, the default is it's only gonna you know, export things that you're actually selling, so quantity is not zero. And at that point, uh, it only takes a moment, you can email that to anyone on the planet they can load into a spreadsheet, they can load into a word processor, they can very, very quickly know what you've got for sale. That is what I would do, because I don't like wasting my, well, I, I'd, I'd say I don't like killing trees, but mostly I just don't like paying for toner. Um, if I didn't mind paying, paying for toner, or if I just wanted a prettier report, another way to go is come up under here, go to the report menu, and go to price list. And that'll come up in just a moment. Of course, on the other screen. Um, 
And what that's going to do is it's going to you know, give you a very nice, pretty thing saying, all right, here's what the comic is. Here's maybe a picture of it. Here's, you know, what was special about it. Here's what its going rate is and so forth. You can, you know, include your cost or not include your cost. Uh, and then what I would do then is I would uh, either save that to the web so I could view it on a, uh, a, an iPad or uh, some one of those devices. Or what you can do is you can preview that and export that out from the preview window as a PDF. Or if you really do like killing trees or you've got some really cool stuff that's worth killing trees for, go ahead and just print it out. Um, so anyway, that is what I would do if I were just selling things. All right, lastly, and we're getting to the end here. Um, your goal at this point, I'm assuming, is to, again to have somebody show up with a moving van and a bunch of you know burly guys and, and send you a big check and take your comics off you. Um, this can make that happen. Let's set expectations a little bit. All right. If you're selling to a comics dealer or you're selling to a private collector who might one day want to sell these again, you let's say you've got a hundred thousand dollars worth of comic books. You aren't going to get a hundred thousand dollars as your offer. You're not going to get eighty thousand as your offer. If you have really freaking great stuff, right? I mean, just stuff that they think they can move in a heartbeat, you might see forty or fifty. You're much more likely to see a number like twenty or twenty-five. Uh, and God help you, if your comics really are kind of undifferentiated food, like if, you've, if all you have is copies of Night Stalkers from, you know, the Marvel glut of the 1992, you might be more or less selling them by the pound. If I recall uh, my, my friend Joe Koch, uh, who's in that business, uh, pallets full of comic books sold by the pound go for something like a quarter a pound. Um, so you want to be as far away from that as you can, but if the, you know, if the comic dealer you're selling to you know, with your hundred thousand dollars for the comic books, offers you twenty-five grand for him, doesn't mean he's trying to rip you off. I mean, it's this is just, you know, be braced for it now because that's just the reality of selling anything resale, right? Just like you were trading your time for money, you know, you know, you wanted to get these off your hands. He has to take them into his inventory, figure out what he can sell really quickly, mark them up on his end, and he's gonna he's gotta take the dross and move it down the line to the next guy, or he's gonna you know move into his shop and and waste some time you know retailing and you know and you know and merchandising your stuff in his stuff, and he's gotta make some vig for that. He's gonna you know and the typical vig they're always looking to make 100% off of what they made at the end of the day. That's kind of that's kind of like the gold minimum. Um, so don't be surprised you know when you see numbers like that as an offer. With that said, there's another alternative which a lot of people don't think of, which might help you out. Um, and we used this back uh, with human computing. Uh, so we had done a deal when we were first, you know, building our database with comic books. We 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 found a guy who actually had received comp copies of comic books of comic books from Marvel, DC, Dark Horse, and Image. And they were like they worked in sales in some place. I'm not going to name the name, but but they had uh, you know they'd been entitled to the comp list comic so one of everything these publishers made, and they just would take them home in the original boxes they were given to them for just shipping boxes, scroll them away in their basements, go back to work the next day, forget all about them, lather, rinse, and repeat for like six years. Uh, so they at the end of the day they're moving out of their house. They said oh, I got a couple pallets worth of comics I never even opened up the shipping boxes on, and I'm sitting there going. I don't know, this is like 1990 through 1997 of all four publishers. I mean, we'll fill in some holes. We'll certainly fill in our covers, you know, for that whole thing. And we'd love to get a hold of them. Let's make you a deal. And I made him a deal that was literally comics by the pallet load on those. Um, but at the end of the day, we didn't need them either. You know, these are these were not easy to get rid of comic books. They were not particularly you know, uncommon. They were not particularly sought after. These were as glutted comic books as you're ever going to see. Um, and what we decided, just because we wanted the shelf space at one point, is we took a great many of these ones and we decided we're going to donate them to literacy programs. Uh, we were living in high-tax California at that point. I mean, if you're, in, if you're in California and you earn money, it's like you can find your total tax as well over 50% pretty easily. Uh, and we were looking at a point where we say, like, when you donate something, you're entitled to give its full market value away. Well, guess what? You've got the full market value right in Comic Base. So by inventorying them in Comic Base and then marking them out of the database as we went, um, we could come up with a big, you know, uh, using the, uh, the, uh, uh, the POS command. Let me show you that one. See the guys in the first in the first session did not get this great information. Um, so what you can do here is uh, there's a sales terminal in Copy's Pro and Archive Edition where you can pull this up and literally just 
beep out your own comic books. It'll give you an itemized total of however many you've got, you know, with a receipt, you know, that you can give to the tax guy. Um, and all you gotta do is beep each book as you go. It'll mark them out of your inventory, give you the receipt, tell you what the whole thing was worth. And at that point, I've got a receipt for the tax guy for, you know, at that point, I wanna say it was like $8,000, which then came off my taxes, which, you know, at my tax rate was worth way more than I could have gotten just selling them on the market. Um, so that's a talk to your accountant kind of question. It's a consider your personal you know, circumstances kind of question. But I'd say before you just you know, give them to the guy with the, you know, with the U-Haul, before you just give them, you know, put them out on Craigslist as free comics or whatever you do like that, you know what? It could be that one of your better moves, because you might be making 25, 30%, you know, depending on your tax bracket of their full market value, is donate them. Um, in that particular case, um, I, I, you know, I said I give them to a literacy program. It was the literacy program in Santa Clara County. Uh, years later, I had occasion to ask uh, the guy there and say, "Hey, what y'all ever do with all those hundreds and hundreds of copies of Punisher and Barbie fashion?" And he said, eh, "We gave them to the prisons." And I felt a little weird about that. So anyway, uh, hopefully it did some good for someone, and, and hopefully the tips will give do some good for you. Guys, thanks for coming. This is a first ever redo of the live stream. I hope you join us for the real one. The real one is at 4 o'clock on Wednesdays, uh, hopefully not involving horrific, horrific wailing audio. I'm going to go end this one right now, and I'm going to uh, replace the live stream with this one here, and we're going to pretend the previous one, despite all the great you know, chat traffic, didn't happen. Please, as they say, like and subscribe. It does help spread the word uh, and, and get things around, and it'll also let you know when the next one comes out. Thanks again, guys.